Hi, this is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. And today, we are going to be revealing the secrets of stacking your compressors, layering one compressor on top of another. If you've been involved in audio or music production for any length of time, you've probably heard this idea of try not to get all of your compression out of just one compressor. Instead, have two or more compressors, each one doing a little bit instead of one compressor or a limiter grabbing down and squeezing things a lot. Is that a good idea? Should you be using multiple compressors like that in series, stacking them, layering them one on top of the other instead of just using one compressor, doing a little bit more compression? And are there any like rules about it? Are there certain types of compressors that pair better with other types of compressors? Any notes about like attack and release settings and ratios and that kind of stuff? Like, can you systematize this idea of how is it best to stack your compressors if you're going to do that? And I've got answers for all that and a whole lot more. Let's dive right into it. Quick little disclaimer, this is a podcast episode, which means it's a talking format. The focus is on giving you the concept so you can go and make your own audio examples. So there aren't a ton of audio and video examples in this podcast episode. Those are for you to make. That said, I might one of these days make a full-length course just on compression. I've got a full-length course, Mixing Breakthroughs, that covers compression quite a bit, as well as another full-length course, Mastering Demystified, that covers compression in the context of mastering quite a bit. But I think I might make a dedicated one just on compression and give you guys some audio examples and video examples that way. If you want to be alerted to that when it comes out, just go over to sonicscoop.com, sign up for our newsletter up on the top right-hand side of the screen, and we'll let you know when that course comes out. Or go ahead and sign up for one of our free workshops on mixing, like the five habits of every great mixer that you can get at sonicscoop.com slash mixhabits. That's sonicscoop.com slash mixhabits. That's a great one. It really covers the five things that all of the amazing world-class mixers who we've interviewed, studied, had on MixCon, who I've worked alongside or interviewed, the things that they do in every single mix that you might not be doing yet and that you should do. So check that out, the five habits of every great mixer at sonicscoop.com slash mixhabits, totally free workshop. And if you sign up for that, you can get onto our mailing list as well. So we'll let you know when a full-length compression course does come out. Ultimately, if you prefer something free on mastering, we've got the free workshop Mastering 101 that you can get over at sonicscoop.com slash mastering 101. That's sonicscoop.com slash mastering 101, where you can get encapsulated the ins and outs of what mastering is, how to go about it, what kind of tools we're using, what the goals are, and give you your first steps on going down that road yourself, or even if you're just going to be working with a professional mastering engineer for the first time. All right, let's get right into it. Before we do, the briefest of shout outs to our sponsors, Sound Toys, more about them later, making some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com. Also, big shout out and thanks to Focusrite, making some killer interfaces. I've been using their stuff for a couple of decades now. They make great stuff all the way from the entry-level Scarlett line, all the way up to the high-end RedNet series. It's hard to get better bang for the buck than you're going out of Focusrite. All right, let's get right into it, this idea of stacking your compressors, layering your compressors, or as I've called it in other episodes of the podcast, serial compression. We just did an episode last week about parallel compression, right? That's the idea of having one heavily compressed channel and then one uncompressed channel, same instrument, same source, and blending them together. Those would be parallel sources. This idea of serial compression or stacking compression is one compressor goes into the other. Why would you do that? Is it a good idea? And I think the answer is yes. In a lot of cases, Serial compression, stacking compression, layering compression is a great idea and something you should be doing on certain types of sources. There are also certain types of sources where it doesn't make quite as much sense to use this kind of stacking compression. But I want to give you a couple of big principles, best practices for why and how you would do this. So first, before we get into the hows, you need to understand how and why compression can go bad. And always when you're compressing, you're going to be messing with the sound in some way. Compression can be relatively transparent. It can be relatively uh, aggressive and apparent. But no matter what, there's an attack time and a release time on that compressor. You can think of the attack time as being kind of how long it takes before the compressor kicks in would be a simplified way of thinking about it. So if you have a long attack time, a slow attack time, 
it kind of lets the initial transient in and then clamps down. That's what the compressor does. If you have a super fast attack time, it's going to immediately get the signal down. As soon as the signal comes in, goes above that threshold, the point where the compressor is supposed to kick in, as soon as that compressor gets past that threshold, it'll immediately clamp down if you have a super duper fast attack time. And each of these has pros and cons and trade-offs, and each of these has potential negative consequences. The negative consequence potentially of using a slow attack compressor is that you don't really compress your signal much at all. You don't get any dynamic control on the front end, the initial impact of the attack. And if you're talking about real live played instruments, that's where so much of your dynamic variation comes from in the initial attack. And if you're missing that with a long, slow attack, then you're not getting much dynamic control. If anything, things can actually end up sounding a little bit more dynamic, counterintuitively enough, through a long enough attack in a compressor. So that's the potential negative of using a slow attack. But there's also a potential negative of using too fast of an attack. If you use a super fast attack compressor, you're doing a lot of compression. You get a lot of dynamic control, but you smooth off the transient edge and you make things sound a little more dull and lifeless and further away and kind of lacking clarity and just a little bit veiled. Now, either of these can be a good thing, right? A slow attack compressor can bring out vibrance and life. A fast attack compressor can give you control and smoothness. But either of these things taken too far can be bad. So if you're going to stack compressors, this is one of the first things to think about. Often, you'll be stacking a fast attack compressor with a slow attack compressor. So you can have a little bit of best of both worlds, and you can kind of compensate for the shortcomings of one with the benefits of the other. And that's what's going on under the hood when you're layering compressors well stacking compressors well, doing serial compression well, you're taking that into account. And I'll give you case in point of a way that I use it a lot in mastering, and you can think of ways to use it in mixing, and I'll go over some ways in mixing. But in mastering, it's not uncommon for me to use two stages of compression, one with a fast attack and one with a slow attack. We'll talk about other variables in a minute, like release and ratio and other things. But attack is, I think, the, the first big thing to understand. And when you start to be able to hear and understand the attack of your compressor, you start to unlock compression and really hearing compression and really coming up with strategies about how to use it. And there's exercises you can do to help you with that. But one of the key places that I put this stuff into practice every day as a mastering engineer is when I have tracks that often weren't mixed with a lot of bus compression or bus processing, or the mixer just did less compression than what you often hear on major releases, it's sometimes my job, depending on the genre, to add some more and to make things feel a lot more polished and controlled and just more finished and more commercial. And on some tracks, that involves me adding more compression. But if I just throw it through one compressor and it has a slow attack and I add a ton of compression, I don't make things sound smoother and more controlled. If anything, I bring up some of the erratic nature of that performance. Now, the thing that I might want to do on some of these relatively uncompressed, natural, kind of raw recordings is to get them a little bit more tight and to get some of these overly dynamic players feeling a little bit more gelled together would be to use a fast attack compressor. And this can be a thing in particular on drum kits that haven't really gone through much processing at all. And the particularly when the player is a little bit all over the place with the dynamics, you really want to use a fast attack compressor to contain that drummer and to contain the rest of the band whose dynamics might be a little much compared to what you really expect out of a finished commercial release. But when I do that, when I start smoothing things out, we can lose life. We can start to get things a little too smooth, a little too dull, and we lose some vibrance. And that's where the slow attack compressor comes in. Stage two, to take our now flattened out transients that have been made more consistent, that have been made more smooth, and now 
bring all of those transients and initial tacks up together using that slow attack compressor. Now, I'm kind of giving you all the technical, theoretical reasons behind why this works, but people have been doing this for decades without thinking this concretely and specifically about how it works and why it works. And there have been tricks, uh, you've probably heard this one, maybe at some point, if you haven't, you're going to hear it now. A common coupling for many decades was, you know, an 1176 compressor into an LA-2A, or vice versa. It could be an LA-2A into 1176. But the reason they couple well is because the 1176 has notoriously fast attack for a compressor. Its attack settings basically go from ridiculously fast to still pretty darn fast. And the LA-2A, it has a medium-ish attack. I wouldn't say it's a super slow attack. It's not like what I consider like a slow attack would be when we're getting into 25 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds, 40, 50. That I definitely consider a slow attack. And LA-2A isn't like that. It's a little bit more program dependent. If I remember correctly, the LA-2A attack time is something in the neighborhood of 10 milliseconds, although it can vary depending on the program material, what exactly is being fed into it. But I think it has an average attack time of something around 10 milliseconds. So there's definitely transients that are getting through, that are poking through and potentially even being enhanced compared to an 1176, which has that, you know, super fast attack time. I think it's like slowest attack setting is still like under a millisecond or something like that. And you also get into the idea with these two classic compressors, the 1176 and LA-2A, which people think pair well and stack well into one another, the idea also of potentially stacking ratios, where that faster attack and often faster release compressor might have also a somewhat higher ratio, where its lowest ratio setting would be something like four to one, and then it goes higher and higher than that, where again, the LA-2A, I believe, has an average ratio of somewhere around four to one or lower, again, depending on program material and how hard you're hitting it. And these things are also stacking release time. So you might have a super fast attack compressor with a super fast release and a somewhat higher ratio for compressor, say four to one and up. And that thing is acting almost like a soft, gentle limiter, just controlling peaks, controlling transients, controlling dynamics. And then we're going to that second compressor in this example, say an LA-2A that has potentially a lower ratio a somewhat slower attack to bring back some of that bite and front edge articulation kind of back into the sound. And then often a little bit of a slower release. And in the case of the LA-2A, you almost have like stacked releases inside of an LA-2A compressor where it let go, lets go a bit and then it lets go a bit more and then it lets go a bit more at a kind of variable rate. So this is something else that's happening. And inside of itself, it pretty much had what you might consider a layered release time. So basically, long story short, because of the differences in attack time, in release time, and to some degree in ratio, that is what makes one compressor going to another, going to another. It's a big part of what makes that work better than getting all of your compression out of one compressor that is going to give you its idiosyncrasies in full. So if that is a slow attack fast release compressor, it's going to let those initial transients out, and then it's going to release so fast that brings up some extra trash and edge. And this could be just what the doctor ordered. Sometimes maybe you want to do a ton of compression with a slow attack, fast release compressor. The other way around, sometimes you might want to do a ton of compression with a fast attack, slow release compressor, where that fast attack is really smoothing off the initial impact and that long release is kind of keeping things smooth and we're kind of taking an edgy sound and maybe pushing it further back into the, the distance, you know, behind the speakers. But for most sounds where you don't want the compression to be too apparent, too obvious, too effecty, not morphing the sound too much, doing it in two or more stages can be helpful because you're not ever getting the full idiosyncrasies of any one attack and release and ratio setting. And instead, you're using two, often with different attack and release and sometimes different ratio settings that are helping kind of to soften the blow.
This works in so many places. Anything you want to dynamically control that is played live, particularly drums, bass, your buses, potentially even your mix bus, maybe. In mastering, I'll often use two stacked. In vocal processing, it's very common to use more than one compressor, each doing a little bit. Now, you don't have to go crazy. You don't have to use five and six and seven compressors on a vocal. I mean, some people will. In general, I think it's better to get to a great sound with fewer processors because I think it forces you into thinking about what the sound really needs and getting exactly the right tool for the job. And auditioning a couple things and say, that one sounds right. That one's taking me in the right direction. And then when you push it too hard saying, ooh, it's taking me a little too far in this direction, what kind of different compressor would complement this? And then find another one and audition a few and say, this, this is giving me what I need. That other one was giving me too much edge. This is smoothing it back out a little bit. It's a nice balance. And I think that's generally a better way to go rather than ending up with these like vocal tracks that have, if you're in the box, have, you know, 12 different plugins on them. Or if you're out in the analog world, you know, a total maze of patch cables with practically every shiny box you have in the studio on one vocal. And I'm not saying not to do that. And sometimes you gotta, you know, chase the rabbit around the tree to finally get to the right vocal sound or snare sound or whatever it is. But I think when possible, slowing down, evaluating, and really taking the time to listen and evaluate before you do and decide, I think will often give you better results and keep you having confidence in the decisions that you're making. Now, where don't you do stacking compression? Just like in the parallel compression episode we did last week, if you're in really seriously sample-based music, serial compression, the stacking compression, layering compression is not as relevant on your sample-based instruments. Again, because you already have the consistent dynamics out of your sample-based instruments. You already have consistent transients from one hit to another. Each snare sounds exactly the same and has the exact same intensity unless you tell it to be otherwise. That's very different than, say, a live drummer. Each one of those bass notes is kind of blossoming the same amount unless you tell it to do otherwise. That can be very different than a live bass player. So when using compression in the electronic or EDM context or, you know, hip hop context, it's more likely than on a lot of the instruments that A, compression is not your biggest fix to begin with because compression is number one job. As much as nerds like me talk about how compression will reshape your sound, it doesn't reshape it that much compared to things like EQ, delay, saturation, you know, distortion, flanger, phaser, chorus, whatever. Those effects reshape your sounds significantly more. And the reshaping that compression does is like a somewhat subtle byproduct of the process of getting dynamic control. So in general, in electronic music, rather than getting these fancy compression techniques, Often, if you want a compressor to kind of reshape things a little bit, reshape the attack a little bit, or smooth off the attack a little bit, just use one most of the time, right? Hey, this sound is great, but has a little bit too much attack or a little bit not enough attack, or I want to bring out the sustain, the resonance a little bit more. I'll use a fast release compressor. Some degree of subtle reshaping in hip hop, in electronic music, on sampled instruments can be relevant to do a little bit of that. But it, those are relatively subtle changes most of the time. And you don't necessarily need to stack them because you don't have the problem that I've described here of wanting consistent dynamics, but also wanting the transients to still remain. You can usually just use one compressor and use it well to slightly reshape things tonally and more often lean on your other stuff more that makes a much bigger difference. Now, when it comes to vocals, in the electronic context, in the hip hop context, then all this stuff goes again. Then your stacking compressors, your layering compressors, your parallel compressors, all that stuff is relevant again for the few live organic elements you might have in a more electronic style. Well, I hope this one has been useful for you. 
I made this episode longer than I expected. I start talking about compression and I keep on going. I'm a bit of an audio dork, aren't I? And I I'm glad that you've joined me in audio dorkitude. It's been wonderful to have you with me for this episode. Uh, thanks for nerding out with me. If you want to nerd out with me even harder, even more, and you want to study the things that all of the great mixers have in common, check out our free workshop, The Five Habits of Every Great Mixer, that you can get at sonicscoop.com slash mixhabits. That's sonicscoop.com slash mixhabits. Free workshop. These are the five things that all of the best mixers on the planet do in all their mixes. I know because I've talked personally to many of these people, having interviewed them, often having them as guests on our channel, particularly for things like MixCon. And they really have all five of these things in common. Some just do four, but most of them do all five. Check that out, sonicscoop.com slash mixhabits. That's totally for free. And if you want my free intro to mastering, you can check that out, sonicscoop.com slash mastering101. Course, there's the full length courses like Mixing Breakthroughs and Mastering Demystified. Don't be shy. Check them out. Money back guarantee on them. I think they are going to change the way that you work forever for the better. Mixing Breakthroughs is really about getting you breakthroughs in your efficiency when it comes to mixing so you can mix faster, more creatively, more confidently than ever before and earn more per hour doing it and just Get your chops up to a level where you feel like you know what you're doing in the mix and you have a plan of attack and roadmap. You definitely want to check out the full-length course, Mixing Breakthroughs. Or if you want to know everything that I know about mastering, literally everything I know about mastering, check out Mastering Demystified over at masteringdemystified.com. I think you're going to love them. Big shout out and thanks to our sponsors, Sound Toys, making some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Try anything they make for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com. Things like the Decapitator, the Devilock Deluxe, the Radiator, the Primal Tap, the Phase Mistress, uh, Echo Boy. There's just so much good stuff in there. Definitely try those out if you haven't already over at soundtoys.com. Also, big shout out and thanks to Focusrite, making some of the best, most killer bang for the buck interfaces out there from the entry-level Scarlet line all the way up to the high-end RedNet series. Thanks for hanging out with me again. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. See you next time.